Hello, everybody, to our first edition of this lecture series, Making Sense of the Digital Society, already in our fifth year, actually. It's hard to believe we started out in December 2017, and we're in our fifth year now. We're uh, going to do approximately four editions of the series this year, and uh, this is the first. So uh, on behalf of the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and um, the federal Agency for Civic Education, a very warm, warm welcome to you at home, uh, where you're watching or <laughs> wherever you're watching, uh, Alex TV or the streams on the respective websites of uh, uh, the partnering agencies here, and of course, uh, the people here on site in Berlin who are actually present. So tonight's edition of the series is not the first time actually we speak about changing media ecosystems. We are in our fifth year, as I said already, and let me just real quickly um, refer to you to uh, Christoph Neuberger's talk a good four years ago, actually, um, who talked about democracy in the public sphere, um, Rasmus Klein Nielsen about the power of platforms and how publishers adapt. And also when Josef van Dijk talked about Europe and responsible platform societies referred to the impact the geopolitical tech competition have on our civic societies and their media infrastructure. All of these talks, and many more actually, you will find online on a very advanced, I think, compendium on the uh, website of the Humboldt uh, Institute for Internet and Society. Check it out. There's um, all those talks online in video and in audio, and uh, there's additional podcasts actually around the subjects um, those talks were centered on. But surprisingly to some, not to others, um, you might say, we hardly ever talked about the specificities of media ecosystem in Central Eastern Europe, of which Eastern Germany, and which grounds we actually stand on now here in Berlin, of course, uh, is also, or was also, part of. So when tonight's edition was devised, the war in Ukraine was several months away, of course. We are fully aware that with the ongoing Russian aggression, our subject takes turns that the speakers and we, the curators, could not have foreseen on this massive scale. And we will discuss what the current situation means for fake news, manipulation, and so on in the digital sphere in Central Eastern Europe. But despite the heavy concentration of new subject matters, um, we firstly and mainly want to draw attention to the recent history of media systems in Eastern Europe and its many changes it has brought about in the last 15, well, to actually 30 years uh, we're facing now already. As always, history in order to get a better view of the current situation and of the possible developments, especially for independent media and the digital sphere in the near future. Of course, we're going to have ample space in the conversation to uh, talk about many subjects concerning the war and uh, what kind of change this might bring about uh, in other Eastern countries as well. If you want to follow further the path of the digital public in the war, there are several events at the Humboldt Institute, actually, and the federal agency you will be able to find right away, again, on their respective websites. Let me just point to you real quickly to a format called the Digital Salon that's taking place at the end of March, uh, I believe. Um, on uh, solidarity, internet solidarity with Ukraine, that's about the subject there. Uh, and on BPB, the Bundeszentrale for Politische Bildung, that's the German name for the Federal Agency of Civic uh, Education, you will find updates on media coverage of the war in all of Europe. That's, I think, an important widening of the scope of info, especially for people uh, and viewers uh, living in Germany, with such a heavy dose of the German-centered perspective we get here. So let us have a good look at how we got where we are now in CEE. And in the conversation after our two introductory talks, yes, you heard right, this is also a premiere uh, in that we feature two main guests, Marius Dragomir and Christina Rosgoni. So the structure unfolds, uh, you know, regulars probably know already what's going to happen now, pretty much the same way, except that we have two speakers now. After this short intro, it's going to be the first talk by uh, Marius, then it's going to be a short introduction to our second guest, Christina Rosgoni. It's going to be her introductory talk. Then we join for a um, conversation among the three of us for about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, but you will also have the possibilities to ask questions through Slido, our digital tools, and there's going to be a microphone here 
on site at this venue at Säerchen at Holzmarkt in Berlin as well to join the conversation. Um, and I'm sure we'll hear many questions tonight after um, this subject. So to our first speaker. He was a journalist uh, himself in his home country of uh, Romania, so he does have first-hand experience of change in the media field uh, and of the transformation after the Warsaw Pact dissolved. Of course, this was followed by maybe an even greater transformation for media, for all of us, digitization. In 1999, he started working for an English language media too, but he changed sides, so to speak, uh, after that and pursued an academic career in media studies. He worked for the Open Society Foundation and uh, managed a research and policy portfolio on independent journalism in London, where he also co-edited a large study called Mapping Digital Media. As of today, he is the director of the Center of Media, Data and Society at CEU, Central, Uni uh, Central European University in Vienna. His introductory talk is about, I quote, the risks independent journalism in Central Eastern Europe is likely to face in the near future. Please welcome from Vienna to Berlin, Marius Dragomir. Thank you, Toby. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, in this event, it's uh, it's great to be here. First of all, I have to say that it's always a pleasure to be back in Berlin. It's um, it's great to, to be with you uh, on on the site as well with, with the public after a while. So thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation. Um, indeed, um, what I'm going to talk today again, some of you will tell me, um, is the. Uh, uh, the state of independent journalism in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and yes, indeed, I, I, I was lucky to have the, uh, lucky and old enough to have the um, experience of uh, working as a journalist in, in the region in several countries. Romania was one, uh, the Czech Republic was another. Um, but also, uh, indeed, uh, as you have heard, um, for the past maybe 10, 15 years, I also spent my time researching the media, so f looking at, at what's happening in a field in which I was once uh, a part of. Um, it's, um, when we designed this, uh, this lecture, it was about the future of journalism, what is happening to journalism today. Um, and um, it, I was thinking that the best way to do that would be to, by, by really looking into the past, into the, the, the past two decades, three decades, and, and try to understand what has happened during this time with the media and journalism. And in fact, I, I, I uh, did that exercise thanks to a chapter in a book that I, uh, that, uh, I wrote last year, and the book appeared this year, uh, in which I was asked to look at the past 30 years of journalism in Romania and try to answer the question, did, independent, did journalism uh, help in the democratization process in Romania? Um, although, to be very honest, initially I, I thought it's going to be um, quite a tedious uh, type of work because you go back to the same things, you go back to your own country where you worked um, in, in quite difficult conditions. In fact, it was a fascinating and intellectually fascinating experience because I got back to many years ago and I looked back at those years with, with, the, uh, with the, the mind of today and with the experience that we have today. Um, and it was great, and that's what I'm going to share with you. I know you will tell me, you know, this guy is going to pack in 15 minutes, 30 years of, uh, of experience, but I, I will try to do that. Um, and um, um, also, uh, I, I have to tell you that I, I'm really, I, I love talking about this, this topic, but at the same time, when I, when I um, uh, did this exercise, looking at all these years, I realized, um, thinking about the events where I was in, that it seemed to me that always I spoke about the same things. And that is, a, that is quite bad because what was happening, I, I realized now that things has, haven't actually improved when it comes to regulation, to independent journalism over all this time, in spite of the hopes that we had many years ago. Uh, last week when I uh, was talking to a journalist based in Budapest about this event, he asked me what are you going to do in Berlin and I said, I'm going to talk about the future of journalism and he said, what future? Um, 
and this is uh, this is the the question that that you know we, we keep asking ourselves and I did myself too uh, and I did it for for today's event so looking back at what happened with um, with the media I was trying of course there are many uh, many trends that happened over this period of time and at the same time um, the, the experiences in various countries are very different because yes, this region has common um, uh, common characteristics, um, the common history sometimes, uh, common uh, ways of development, but at the same time there are many differences in how countries have evolved. But still, if, if you look back, what I found uh, very important among all these trends and factors that influenced independent journalism, uh, in my view, I think are five uh, key trends. First of all is the, the government control. Um, and here, uh, I'm sure that many of you have um, uh, have seen the, uh, the the growing influence of the government in the uh, in the media and how that manifested. First of all, it was uh, back in the 90s when cent when in most of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, um, uh, the governments were trying to create regulatory authorities. The whole process was very politicized. From the very beginning, these bodies were staffed with people close with the political uh, parties in power, um, and everything uh, was, was working according to the political logic. Uh, another uh, example of politicization was uh, the reform of the former state media. As, as, as you know, the, all the countries in Central and Eastern Europe inherited uh, uh, these uh, large broadcasters that were, um, that were operated by the state. And there was a process in the 90s that was trying to reform this state media into public media uh, outlets. A process that, in my view, in most of the, the countries, except for, a, a, for a, a few of them, like the Czech Republic, like the Slovak television, in some, some moments in time, most of this process was, was a failed experiment, uh, in my view. Um, talking about the co concentration of ownership, that is a very important trend, and I, um, I, I, I guess those of you who, um, who are uh, old enough to remember the early days after the, the fall of communism, you, you might uh, remember the, the explosion of media outlets, lots of newspapers. I remember in Romania in, in 1990, you couldn't actually count anymore the number of newspapers. Television stations started to, to operate. But then if you look after 1994, what is happening in, in most of these nations, there is an increase in the uh, uh, concentration of media ownership. What that means essentially is that powerful uh, companies are taking over media outlets and you see, uh, in fact, uh, just, just a few companies controlling large parts of the, of the markets during this, those years. What was the effect of this trend? Obviously, uh, was a negative, a very negative effect, in, in fact, in many countries on diversity and pluralism in the media. And why is that important? Why is that important when we speak about independent journalism? It is simply because it, it helped reduce the space for independent media uh, to, to, uh, to a, a level where it was in some countries almost impossible, uh, in fact, to operate as an independent journalism. The third um, important um, uh, a factor, in my view, was uh, this word that we scholars used a lot, very hard sometimes to pronounce, the instrumentalization of the media. Uh, what that means, in fact, is a combination of the, the, the first two trends. It's when you have media outlets that are either controlled by the government, or owned by media companies that are uh, controlled by oligarchs close to the government. Um, and in that situation, what you have is a situation where the media outlets are not, are not operated for their news purpose, but they are operated to pursue the interests of the owners, either political interests, sometimes even personal interests. And again, the effect is uh, another blow to the independent um, uh, media and, and journalism. Of course, in, in many countries, the, the economic situation was very important for how uh, journalism developed, for how media markets developed. Um, and of course, um, in, um, uh, I remember in the, um, uh, the, the early years of 2000, I was working uh, back then in the Czech Republic as a journalist. And 
uh, there was a, a massive growth in the media market, thanks also to the foreign investors, but also thanks to the uh, development, the, the overall economic development of the country. On the other hand, if you look back then, you still have countries like Bulgaria or Romania that because of the slow economy, they also suffered in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the development, the, the financial development of the media. And finally, there is a very important element and that is related to the technology. Um, and I think, I think I'm right when I say that there was a delayed uh, embracement of um, the new technologies across the region. And of course, you cannot generalize, you cannot talk uh, uh, and, and uh, point at this, uh, at this trend in all of the countries, but in, in many of them, the journalists or media outlets didn't react very fast to the very rapid development of the technology in the, in the region. I remember, um, I think it was in the mid-2000s when I was a, a journalist in the Czech Republic and we were, I was sitting with an executive at an advertising um, agency in, in Prague. Uh, he was actually quite advanced. He was reading about technologies and we were in a group with other journalists and he was talking about how this new channel, YouTube, was going to revolutionize the media markets. And although all the people in the room, including myself, uh, were journalists covering uh, marketing and media, we didn't even know how to spell the name at the time. I remember when the interview was finished, we came back to the office and we said, this guy is talking about this thing, it sounds like you too. Like we, when we searched the internet, it, all that came up was the band, the music band. And um, it was really, we were very skeptical. My editor-in-chief said, in fact, you know, maybe we don't run that story because if we don't understand, if we don't even know how to spell the name of the company, let's drop it. And there was this skepticism among even the people covering that about technologies about especially about people uh, who are coming to us and telling us in three five years everything will be internet everything will will be dominated by the internet and they were right in fact but that had a very again another a very uh, negative impact on uh, on the media development in uh, in the region I believe so if you, if you think about all that and compare to what we have today, uh, which is uh, uh, what I describe by this concept, concept of media capture, it is in fact a combination of all these trends. What has happened, especially in the past 10 years, was um, on the one hand, uh, these trends have intensified. Uh, the space for independent media has shrunk even more. And the public discourse uh, became heavily dominated by the government narrative. And this is the result of media capture. Th there are already um, a lot of uh, definitions of media capture. Uh, in fact, this concept was very young some years ago, but uh, in the past few years, uh, many scholars have written books about the concept and tried to define what it actually means. And what media capture is, is in fact uh, a situation where the governments, the political parties in power, team up, and this is exactly the term, team up with powerful businesses, usually owned by oligarchs, to control vast parts of the media with the purpose of uh, winning elections and having access to public resources. So this is what, what media um, capture is, and it's very important to really think about when did that happen? When did we start having this new trend of capturing of media outlets? Of course, it's very difficult in a paper that I wrote two years ago, I was asked to, to uh, establish the date of birth of media capture, and it is very difficult, or the key events that, is, that trigger the media capture. But I, I think if we look back, there are two, two major uh, events that actually triggered the, the capture. On the one hand is the exit of the foreign investors from Central and Eastern Europe. We mapped the, the foreign companies that own the media for, for many years. And already since 2006 until now, most of the 17 most prominent investment companies present in the media in the whole region left uh, these countries, some of them selling all their assets. And the second very important turning point was the crisis from 2007 and 2008 that increased on the one hand the economic vulnerability of the media companies. They started to lose money, they started to, uh, to face uh, extreme financial predicaments, and as a result, many of them got bought by local oligarchs. 
So if you look at that, and this is what we try to do um, when we uh, study the, the phenom phenomenon of media capture, what, what does it mean, in fact? Uh, how do you recognize that? And this was uh, 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 a very large part of our work in the past two, three years with our younger researchers and students. We were looking at various examples in the region and trying to understand what are the elements. How do you recognize capture? Looking at more, uh, almost all the, the, the nations in the region, what we came up with is, is a model that consists of these four major trends. One is the regulatory capture. This is when governments uh, appoint their own people at the, at, in the management of, of the regulatory bodies. These bodies are usually those that give licenses to broadcasters that, that, that regulate the media market. The second is the, the control of public media. Um, and again, I, I mentioned already the, uh, the history and the, the attempt of reforming the former state media that, in my view, in most of the countries has failed. Um, and this is, um, uh, this is under the control of the governments. In these two points, it's very easy, in fact, for the governments to control them because there is this tradition when you win the elections, the first thing that you do, you appoint your own people in these bodies. The third is the use of state funding as a control tool. And this is, um, uh, this is a trend that we have seen almost in all the countries. That's the, a situation when the government is using public resources to reward friendly outlets in the form, of, for example, of state advertising or keep the money away from the, the media outlets that are, that are uh, critical of, uh, of uh, your authorities. Um, and that has a very, uh, a very negative impact on, on media companies. And finally, the ownership takeover, and that's a, that's a more difficult process. That has happened over um, uh, more than a decade. Hungary is an example where most of the media outlets have been taken over by oligarchs close to the government. At some point um, in 2018, it was estimated that more than two-thirds of the Hungarian media market was controlled by these by the structures, if not, if not more. So if you, if you really look at um, um, what, what, if you look at what happens um, when you have a situation of media capture, just imagine, imagine that you control the regulatory bodies, so those that make decisions about who enters the market in the broadcasting field. You control the public media, which in many countries are large uh, infrastructure bodies. You control the funding, and usually in many countries these are large amounts of funding that are going to media outlets, and you control the private media. So what is left is barely nothing. If, if you manage to do that, you have an extraordinary control over the narrative in, 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 in your own country. It's very interesting, we have written a lot about this model, that sometimes we received calls from regulatory authorities in some African countries asking us to, to actually design a model. They, they were very confused. They thought that because we write, write so much about these issues, we in fact work for the governments designing this model. But we were on the other side. It was, it was interesting because it, it took us a while to understand actually what they really wanted. So now we have that. What is the impact on, on independent journalism? There are many ways to look at, to look at these issues, but I think I, and I chose to share with you uh, four of the, the types of impact that I think, I think are important. First of all is the economic impact. If you have that situation where you control everything and you spend a lot of public money in the media, you essentially destroy the potential for financial sustainability of the media. Just imagine, and this is something that came up in many discussions we had with, with investors, when you go to such a country where everything is actually controlled and a lot of public money is, is pumped into the media and a lot of the media is subsidized, it's incredibly, if not impossible, to actually set up a media outlet. We talk about the cultural impact, and this is a lot. This is probably the topic for an entire lecture. And this is actually what is happening when you have that type of control you manage to actually shape the consumption patterns and narratives to a point where the propaganda has devastating um, effects on, the, on how people read, how people consume the media, the media and how they actually act upon, upon what they, uh, they consume in the media. There is the impact on the profession, of course, and this is again a topic that has been discussed and it has been analyzed, and this is when you have an extreme polarization of the journalism field 
if you look at most of the countries in the region, you actually see two worlds of journalism. On the one hand, the, uh, the, the massive state-controlled media outlets that employ thousands of people, and then you have very small independent media that um, are hardly trying to, to survive. And of course, you have the technological advantage, and this is something that we are probably going to, to speak more. There are many laws that are adopted in many countries in the region uh, uh, that, that um, in my view, are going to affect the, how people access information, how people consume information. Um, so if you, if you think about all these things, and trying to, to go back to, to, to my question, um, initially that, uh, that I, I set for this talk, um, I was wondering what is going to happen if, if these trends are going to continue. And this is something, I think, the simplest conclusion that I reached. Um, and I reached it looking again at, at various, various places in our region. I, I really see that the impact of, um, of the media capture and these trends on independent journalism is that it reduces journalism to independent journalism to a reactive and corrective function. Reactive is because uh, when you have such a level of control in, in these countries, uh, when you have the, the Hung Hungarian example where you have such an extreme level of polarization and capture, the, the, the first intention and the first reaction of journalists is to be reactive. They do not cover news, but they set up media outlets that first of all are trying to criticize the government, to investigate the government. There are many media outlets in Hungary, in fact, that are doing only that. They were set up with that purpose. They are doing an excellent job. They are very important. They play a very important role. But all, that, all the, the, the work and the role they play is falling under the, the reactive function. And secondly, a lot of the independent media in Central and Eastern Europe, because you have that kind of capture and because governments and government propaganda is expanding so much, another tendency among other media outlets is to correct things. And I'm sure that you have seen these days a lot of initiatives that are focused on fact-checking um, media outlets that are entirely covering only the things and the lies that are promoted through uh, state media. Again, as I said, there is nothing wrong with the reactive, uh, with the reactive journalism. They are important. These are investigative journalism outlets that are doing a great job, and they are important. In fact, there is nothing wrong with the corrective journalism because we need that. In fact, a lot of journalism has to deal with that, but there is nothing in between. And I think this is not um, a trend that we are going to see. It's a trend that, in fact, we are seeing today in most of the countries um, in, in our region. And I only think that will intensify, um, especially with, with the war in Ukraine. I think a lot of these things will intensify. A lot of the government propaganda will increase. Um, and probably the, the two trends will become even stronger than they have been today. With that, I will let my colleague Christina take over the floor and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marius, for this. Uh... Going to join us uh, after our next talk, all the three of us actually here on stage. Thank you for this uh, very clear cut and concise, as well as alarming uh, presentation. Can't wait to hear more about which publishing houses left the CEE. Among them, quite a few German publishing houses, Swiss publishing houses, actually, where I come from. So that'll be interesting uh, to delve a little deeper uh, into that process starting in uh, 2006, I think uh, you said in your. Um, talk there. Can't wait. Um, now to our next speaker, Christina. She started out as a lawyer right at the time of the big system change uh, in Eastern Europe in her native Hungary. Again, political as well as technological change, of course. Her work as a lawyer was concerned with questions of media like funding of community radio stations, self-regulatory bodies, copyright, and so on. That's what she told me in our preparatory call for tonight. That was phase one, she told me. 
phase two. She became a regulator for about a decade at the intersection of telecom and media laws. After 2010, when uh, Viktor Orban came to power, she began to slowly leave Hungary and work in consulting for the European Council, among other agencies, the OSCE and the UN in media subject matters, sending her not only to places like Uganda and Thailand, but also next door of our evening's topic, so to speak, to Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, and yes, quite often the Ukraine. Phase three, entering academia again, doing her second PhD in teaching at University of Vienna. As of this year, she works at the Alpen Adria Universität in Klagenfurt, in Austria as a senior scientist at Institute for Comparative Media and Communication Studies, CMC. Before we all join for a conversation, the three of us, and then it's your turn, of course, at home here on site with the microphone, let us hear more now um, on, I quote, from insult to injury, the state of freedom of expression in Central Eastern Europe in the digital era. Please welcome Christina Rosgoni. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction and um, especially that you took so much notes about my personal remarks. So um, welcome and also a warm uh, uh, welcome from me. Good evening to everyone, offline and online, to this event here in Berlin. This city has been witness to the most tragic events of the 20th century. But it also gave birth to a new and united Europe. The fall of the wall became a globally iconic event. And its images across Central and Eastern Europe came to symbolize possibilities of human freedom and hope for our shared futures. And today, Berlin is watched again, being torn between various multiple interests and its commitment to democracy and ultimately peace. Freedoms of thought and of expression are our most precious liberties from the Baltics to the Balkans. More than 30 years ago, when the fall fell, we hailed our newly gained rights to seek, receive, and impart information and all ideas and ideas of all kinds. However, we were largely unaware about the intrinsic need for the limits and unequipped with the duties and the responsibilities such freedoms should have carried. This dichotomy has proved to be both detrimental and instrumental. The tensions of freedom and of expression were not or not appropriately mitigated with responsibilities and the dear realities of the region. Traumas, interethnic tensions, and historic aggression. I will suggest that the role and the value of free expression have been exploited by political, economic, and social processes. This, in turn, made publics prone to digital waves of uncontrollable hate speech and propaganda-driven disinformation. Responsibilities of the duty bearers, the state, the media, and the interlocutors were systematically and pervasively ignored and undermined. The consequences of this negligence were mostly local and restricted up until the emergence of the digital realm. Today, interconnected networks and platforms expose 
the global costs of online speech harms. I believe it is a unique momentum here in Berlin to take stock of opportunities of digital societies in Central and Eastern Europe. I will do this tonight through the lens of the freedom of expression doctrine and this weaponization potential. And as you will see, I will reiterate and I will come back to several points Marius Dragomir so gratefully and so expressively pointed out, and I will try to contextualize and I will try to theorize for our discussion tonight. Digital societies in this region are embedded in a historically evolved and strategically manipulated communicative sphere. It is experienced through several layers of distorted communication channels. Within this context, East is meant as a symbolic interlinked assemblage of different authoritarian models. Shared remembrance of feudalist, socialist, and communist past. The joint suffering of a never completed democratic transition. Neoliberal economies without labor safety. Seedbed of fraud and corruption. Multi level poverty. State capture and oligarchization. These notions formed the joint vocabulary of the language we speak, without attention to actual linguistic differences. The public sphere in Central and Eastern Europe was meant to be freed up from state control once democratization began. De jure censorship was repealed, and the right to freedom of expression enacted in constitutions. The newly formulated constitutional courts adapted liberal theories of free speech while abolishing the remainder of the authoritarian past. The rights for individual liberties were laid down by the courts in an activist manner, applying invisible constitutions while being forced to settle issues and conflicts deliberately unsettled by politicians. The doctrine of freedom of expression was interpreted mimicking libertarian theories on speech as a distinguished fundamental right, the source of several further freedoms for communications, such as the press or of the media. Generations of young lawyers, me included back then, were trained to believe in the power of truth to prevail within the liberated marketplace of ideas, as we called it. We were to draft new laws, mainly concerned with removing all possible restraints to receive and impart information. All this without the alertness and the considerations about the risks of uncontrolled speech within certain societies which have never been educated on responsible or careful communication. Duties in return to freedoms were we perceived as prior restraints and have been heavily fought against. But our mediated realities were different and intersected with decades of collective traumas exploited for ideologies on tensions and conflicts. Media markets were opened and investors of all kinds were attracted to liberalized market conditions. Commercial mass media was born in the wild east with no strings attached. On many occasions, and similar to lessons we have learned about the colonial past of other contexts, 
entrants showed very different faces to their homegrown audiences than to the new ones. Journalistic values, principles, and ethics were le often left behind in their countries of origin, along with safety nets of journalists. The societal role and public responsibility of the media in, the, in a democratic setting were largely and mainly abandoned. With a very few exceptions, these patterns still prevail and render the media in Central and Eastern Europe unaccountable and the publics to the status of secondary citizens. Under these conditions, the mass media was abused by local and global players and finally captured. Since the global downturn of traditional media and especially of the press, amplified by the 2008 financial and economic crisis and the recent pandemic downfall, media markets by now are weak and beyond recovery. Major investors withdrew from the region and transferred their assets to local shady businesses. They were mostly oligarchs without any second thoughts on compliance or on duties and responsibilities in exchange of their business freedoms. The libertarian regulatory frameworks, of which we were so proud before, proved incapable and non-resilient once they would have been really needed. Those who remained witnessed several shades of censorship. Market forces were increasingly being replaced by political ones and ownership became locally concentrated and distorted. In turn, the very few independent media outlets are fighting for survival today. In the press sector, newly established and crowdfunded online-only digital nomads are grasping for air and are fully reliant on social media platforms. The public media, the desired trustees of the European tradition of duties and responsibilities to free speech never completed the transformation from state media to public media, but acted as the agents and subjects of 30 years of transition. An inclusive and undistorted mediatized public sphere has never come to realization. The experience of enjoyment of collective or individual freedoms has never been shared among the publics of historically oppressed nations. Individual liberties were reserved for the elites. Broad civic resistance against intrusions was systematically disabled and deprivation normalized. The informational power asymmetry only grew. A strong civil society as a potential countervailing power was only mentioned in media development reports about the region, but remained isolated and sporadic. The marketplace of ideas regime clearly failed under these circumstances to cater for democracy. This contested relationship between the media and democracy was observed by scholars like Paolo Mancini and Jan Cielonka as a persistent regional paradox. While the countries in Central and Eastern Europe were said to be consolidated democracies, they have systematically abused fundamental freedoms, such as of expression and the media. The decades of democratic transitions, as Ivan Krastev noted, were perceived as the age of imitation, the attempts at westernization of a region never ingrained. And another project has also failed, Europeanization, in a similarly painful fashion. The accession to the European Union was meant to import meaningful legal and regulatory safeguards, not only to individual, but also to institutionalized freedoms. The idea of Europe united 
was narrated as the end game of the democratization project, accompanied by enforceable minimum legal standards. The four distinguished freedoms of the European Union were meant to secure the next and ultimate level of becoming Europe. However, these beliefs dramatically failed under the first real stress tests and under attack by illiberal, undemocratic member states. It became recently very clear that the free market rationale prevailed over the fundamental individual liberties of the citizens. It was the moment when the European Commission denied having competence in matters of freedom of expression and of the media, when the illusion about Europe, which unifies and protects, was ultimately lost. Despite strong evidence delivered by the EU's own rapporteurs on non-reversible trends in decline in press freedom, media pluralism and independence, the enforcement of the Europeanization has been abandoned and the so-called Copenhagen dilemma blamed. The lack of political will and vision, the deliberate ignorance and weakening of the sanctioning powers of the European Union further exposed freedom of expression to assaults. The net outcome, increased vulnerability to global disruptions and regional challenges. The EU failure saga was an exemplary case on the implications of distinction between market-driven and democracy-driven freedom of expression. Legal scholars like Maria Edstrom or Eva Maria Svensson studied the damaging consequences of this discrepancy to gendered inequalities in the media. In our case, the market-driven approach resulted in a strategic non-interference with the deterioration of media freedom. The systemic commercialization and privatization of free speech in the market logic took high prices and delivered tangible harms. In the Central Eastern European context, it has proved fatal in light of the very recent attacks of the media in Hungary, Poland, and in Slovenia. Additionally, the Western Balkan countries could also take vast advantage of EU worst practices while negotiating the terms and conditions of their accession. It is against this background we need to zoom in and observe the conditions of digital free speech. So the media is caught by economic and political interests. Media freedom is eroded. Journalists work in precarious working conditions and are prone to safety threats, and especially women, to online harassment. The state media spreads propaganda rather than informing the public. The rule of law was abused, accountability schemes are usually non-existent, while regulators non-independent. Publics are prone to hate speech and orchestrated, coordinated disinformation online. Information manipulation is amplified by algorithmic-driven content curation techniques on social media platforms. Similar disorders are of global concern, but there are several regional delicacies we need to consider here. Firstly, globally present internet intermediaries are de facto gatekeepers of information and knowledge. They decide what, when, how, in what context we can find and see on digital media platforms. The decisions on controlling content and information are set, are set by their own profitability-driven internal rules rather than democratic or public interest values. They are in possess of systemic opinion power due to their unique position to access user data, 
the tools to command and organize online attention and the ability to use that data and algorithmic tools for persuasion. As Natalie Herberger contended, this power created various layers of dependencies with direct effect to democratic processes. And this power situation was not attended anywhere in the world with appropriate safeguards, nor checks and balances. In Central and Eastern Europe, this situation is further complicated. Major digital platforms do not invest in local presence, in fragmented, small-scale markets, nor in locally sensitive content moderation human resources. Meanwhile, they are aware about the intrusions and abuses of the digital spaces by local interested parties. By now, we have a solid body of evidence of exploitative data practices by strategic manipulators and of strong correlations with the polarization of societies. It is exemplary, for example, how digital platforms in the Western Balkans within conflict-prone and vulnerable publics neglected their responsibilities and abandoned their online communities. This systemic disconnect, a so-called terra nullius, the unattended digital communicative space provided a fertile ground for the proliferation of ethnic hatred, gender-based violence, and several intersectional forms of hostility. The digital public sphere became a battleground and enabled the weaponization of algorithmic content moderation and curation and the misuse of the digital infrastructure. Social media platforms has also gained enormous economic power over legacy media and they have lost further ground for democratic performance, obviously. Additionally, the publics are not equipped with media and information literacy capacities as countervailing skills and capabilities. And also, there is a general lack of expertise. Academics are siloed and civil society is absent from active engagement with harmful practices. Under these circumstances, the right to freedom of expression suffers, both on the individual and on the societal level. The loss of an open, inclusive, and safe digital public sphere per perpetuated ethnic divisions, eroded democracy, and societal cohesion, tolerance, and ultimately, peace. And this is the moment we need to stop and look around. There is a war next to Central and Eastern Europe. What we have been discussing up until now, theories, constructs, considerations, and implications, replicated into and became the awful reality of aggression, war, and death. Millions of people in this part of the world have been calling unsuccessfully for attention over decades. They have asked for transition justice. They, we, have demanded to finally settle the accounts of the immense political, social, and human costs of a never realized democratic transition. The digital public sphere is one of the terrains where this war has unfolded. Information manipulation, hatred online, and digital propaganda for war surrounded the interventions and the aggression. Traditional media channels framed the narratives. The dominance of digital platforms' opinion powers was demonstrated. In such momentums, the arrangements for thinking through the fundamental rules of speech and media in society are inevitable. 
This is the time and place we need to contest and reconsider what constitutes the basic elements of a democratic society and the media's role within it. States, corporations, large-scale speakers, and civil society have already begun heated debates about the values and principles of the digital information order. A thinker and scholar Monroe Price urged we need to assert and defend what are increasingly deemed old universal principles and understand the new forces. The promise of the digital, the so-called unique selling proposition, was to be building a digitally just world. But today, we see, feel, suffer the evidence that over time, the pioneers of progress and the technologies of liberation have become the new wielders of old authority. The calls of many for a digital new deal, urge for a new consensus for democratic governance. All actors of the digital have to be called on duty, but those with qualified responsibility will have to take an account first. In Central and Eastern Europe, the answers to these questions were often rooted in rebellion at the humiliations of 30 years of imitated transitions. The publics today legitimately demand urgent renegotiations about the freedom of expression dogma in a locally sensitive and inclusive manner. Their voices to be heard and their pains, our pains shared. The disillusions of a never realized nor enjoyed freedom of the many should contemplate the redefinition of the duties and the responsibilities of the few but powerful ones. The Central Eastern European experience is of global relevance. In conflict-prone countries, digital harms scale differently and matter more. In societies without experience or even remembrance of liberties. Right now, at this stage of the digital transition, the lessons learned could shape what comes next. The traumatic consequences of non-responsive neoliberal market-driven freedom of expression to the loss of European values call for urgent reflection and undoing. Global anxieties, challenges, hopes and visions for a better digital future are imminent and direct, and just a few hundred kilometers to the east of Berlin. They call for your attention and action to reclaim the digital for justice. Thank you very much. so much. Is this on? I don't have anything on my monitors. Now I hear something. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christina, uh, for this very engaging uh, talk uh, you just gave us. Uh, you started out with the um, ideology of free speech. You even called it a dogma, the free speech dogma. And um, you closed with it too, calling for a digital new deal. Now, if we hear something like the ideology of free speech here, of course, it being a very Western um, sort of tradition, the First Amendment of the American Constitution uh, is about the free speech and so forth. It's very sort of ingrained in uh, Western thought, uh, what you call the dogma uh, of free speech. Um, and you sort of pointed out that this sort of dogma made the transition uh, in CEE much more difficult. Uh, by following it, because it enabled hate speech and so forth, because there's not enough regulation. Um, now, if we 
pull this to try to pull this together, the free speech dogma and the digital new deal. How do they sort of interconnect and what would be the agency actually to call out for this digital new deal? Would this something would this have to be something to be called for on a European level? Are you calling for the EU, EU actually to uh, um, go into more regulation when it comes to free speech? Did I understand that correctly? Or could you explore a little bit more about the digital new deal and who's going to bring it about? Thank you very much. Um, so uh, there's a long list who should do what, <laughs> I would say. Um, yes, um, if we start with Europe, I believe um, the role of the European Union and also its organs like the Euro European Commission in abandoning um, the realization of freedom of expression is, um, is unique. Um, Marius Dragomir also mentioned the Hungarian example. Let me stick with that. Hungary is getting away for about 13 years of this abuse. And other than letters sent by the European Commission to the government, nothing else happens. And, my, and I'm asking why is that and whose responsibility is that? So, yes, my answer is the European Union and the European Commission do have a qualified responsibility in that case, as one of those. Hmm. Maybe, Marius, you want to continue? Are there other or agencies I should... alongside the EU that should uh, become active uh, there? Platforms. The role of... hmm. So, um, the evidence I have, for example, mentioned um, um, and, and referred to um, that was, um, that was uh, the result of a, as a very extensive research in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina mm -hmm. recently about the strategic non-existence of digital platforms in these countries and the systemic strategic leaving behind of the problems of hate speech, of linguistically, culturally, politically sensitive content moderation needs, which would need investments. Investments in human resources, mm. investment in, in various, various ways by, by these platforms. So the first two um, uh, with a duty, I would call the, the, the international organizations in that way, but also the global media tech companies. Marius, I know you're very skeptical, skeptical about regulating platforms, uh, uh, if I'm correct. Um, and there are some, uh, of course, many incentives on a European level to do that exactly, but it hasn't really worked so far, or had, hasn't brought us very far so far. But the platforms themselves actually started reacting uh, uh, and doing things differently than they've done like five years ago. So could you explore a little bit on that? Regulate platforms, yes or no, and what are the platforms actually Actually doing that you see happening in CEE that you know does bring about some change yes um, hello yeah, yeah. Um, I th totally agree that there is a, a role for the European Union to intervene and um, I, I'm not sure although there are lots of uh, developments at the legal level but I'm not sure uh, that uh, there is a role for any government and or for the EU to intervene at the content regulation um, and I'm saying that uh, based on the experience in, in recent years I totally agree that the European Union I think looking back at the 12 13, 13 years now <laughs> yes he won the elections 13 years ago um, and kept winning them. Um, they, they should have intervened and they should do it. And when I'm looking now at what's happening with the, the so much um, debated discussion on the rule of law and linking that with yeah. the funds and the decision, of course, in, in, the, in the current conditions, they, they might want to justify that I think is terrible because, again, these governments will get away with, uh, with that for an, another four years or, or so. So um, I think there is room for intervention when it comes to the regulation, especially because I'm coming from a, a former community country and especially when I look back at the regulation in these 30 years uh, across the region um, I think on the one hand just to simplify definitely there is a role for governments to regulate the tech platforms at the more structural level 
I think because they have a lot of power, because they have the control over the, the narratives and because they have this immense um, pool of users, definitely they have to, to, to be regulated as any other companies are regulated in terms of market power, dominant positions and all that. But if we look at the content and what has happened um, uh, in all these countries and in others, and also when you see, um, and we have done a study in that respect, when you see the wave of laws that are using the pretext of fake fake news to actually uh, introduce legal restrictions against independent journalism, not only in Europe but in other places of the world, mm. I'm very skeptical and I'm, I find myself sometimes becoming a kind of a fundamentalist anti-regulation person thinking that the governments shouldn't touch that. I, I increasingly believe they shouldn't touch content regulation. Um, and then your question, if the governments don't do that, if the regulators don't do that, then who should do it? Uh, st the, the social media, yes, 10 years ago were very bad at that, um, we know that, but in the past probably three, five years they started to react more, um, and now let's, let's be honest, I think in many cases they reacted because they saw an opportunity here not to fall under regulation of the government, so in other words, they said let's do that because it's better for us to regulate than let the governments regulate it, so, but whatever they did, they started to react. If, if you might have seen a lot of projects on uh, Facebook, Facebook and Twitter, for example, labeling state media, which is an important step. Of course, there is a lot of this uh, debate there. How do you decide about that? Who decides about the criteria um, and all that? And that is a, a legitimate debate, but they still do something. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not totally convinced that they are the answer, that this is the answer for future regulation, the tech companies self-regulating themselves. I think a totally new model of regulation has to be invented. I don't know which one that will be, uh, but definitely I'm, I'm against any, any attempt by governments to get involved in regulating content. Yes, for structural issues, but not content. You made a joke in your talk, uh, a little bit, well, a half joke probably, about a colleague of yours saying, what kind of future of the media are you talking about? And uh, I'd like to take this up, uh, and I'd like to stress the not joking part of this joke, uh, so to speak, uh, and ask you if we keep talking about media, and a lot of times we are talking about legacy or traditional media, uh, as they are called, being captured or not captured, but it's still legacy media, press media, even TV stations, radio stations, of course. Um, what happens if they fail? Because they're losing money all over the place. They're not just losing money in CEE, they're losing money everywhere. Every publishing house in Germany is losing massive amounts of money, except one which is the site at the Holzbrink Gruppe, which is a, a quite of a massive cons a consortium that is actually behind this weekly paper, everybody else is losing money. And uh, we don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now. We didn't know 20 years ago when they started in 2001, actually, when we had the first uh, media crisis with a lot of layoffs, uh, at big publishing papers. We had a lot of concentration. We had a lot of uh, receding regional journalism, of course, also to a lot of concentration there. Um, and what I hear from you, this is... Uh, uh, all a lot worse uh, in most of the CEE countries, right? So what happens if this process just continues, uh, if things actually worsen, and we have to say, well, media are just not going to be part of this transition to more democracy. Who's going to step in? Who would gonna step in or who yeah. should gonna step in? Well, both. <laughs> both. Um, well, I think, yes, definitely the, I, I believe the media field and the journalism field are changing everywhere. And this is not a recent phenomenon. It has been there sure. for uh, starting with YouTube in 2005 and, and the tech companies. Um, uh, the print media is moving online. We know all that. Uh, but while in a few Western European countries you see a kind of um, a trend where media companies are settling for various subscription models, funding models. There are some emerging business models in, in the media uh, in, in some places. In, in other countries, especially those in Central and Eastern Europe, you have a problem because you do, as, as I explained, the, the very fact that you have that captured with regulation, media outlets, the government pouring money into the media, what is happening, you do not have a business model and you do not have companies willing to develop one because it's not possible to develop one. If we talk about Hungary again, where the government controls most of the media, if you want to actually be successful there, I'm just imagining as an investor, you have to set, set up something that will fight the whole market. 
And just imagine what that would look like. So it looks really impossible, but I'm, I'm not trying to be that pessimistic. I think these are developments that have taken years and things can be done. And get, getting back to your question, I think it's quite difficult. I think media companies are kind of avoiding uh, the region for various reasons because simply they will fail. In fact, there was a wave of companies that exited the market, so why would any of them come back? But I think there is a major role for, for Western, uh, the, the remaining liberal democracies, to actually step in and think about designing large funds for, the, for journalism. There has been a lot of discussion about that for more than a decade, and from now and then, now and then uh, things happened. Uh, um, they met and they, they made pledges, but something really serious has, has, has to, to happen. You have the rich liberal uh, democracies in the world that should really be aware, and especially when you see what is happening now in Ukraine, and when you see governments stepping up and increasing their investments in propaganda media, they have to simply pull together resources to fund media in, in most of these places and other places, I think. Mm -hmm. You both talked a lot about polarization, uh, uh, of course, and uh, um, the really hard-working uh, conditions, not just for publishing houses, but for uh, individual journalists uh, as well, especially women with online harassment. Now, if you talk about online harassment of women and, and polarization, this, of course, uh, sounds very familiar uh, in all of Western Europe uh, and probably all of the world, uh, so to speak. Uh, can you tell us a bit more of what's specific about polarization in CEE uh, terrains uh, that you talked about, Christina? What is what? Well, polarization, um, unfortunately, the very recent past, and let's talk right now not about the war yet, mm -hmm. or not in full scale, because that will be probably an uh, other, not an even, evening, but another well, we'll come back to series. That. Yeah. So, but let's talk about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I think the pandemic delivered all the examples, all the evidence, what polarization means. How possible it could have been that people sitting so next to each other have seen, received different realities. How it has been possible that people believed that vaccination would kill them, would chip them, would put them under mm. surveillance of con control and risk their lives and the risk their lives of their families and their beloved ones. Um, this is what is polarization about. This is what is polarization is bringing lives and deaths. And I'm sorry to be so... <sighs> I don't know, emotional about this. Oh, but this is to. what we have seen and this is what we are witnessing right now. Mm -hmm. This is not anymore about being, you know, theoretical about these questions. Mm -hmm. We see what is happening. And we see how much, what is the human cost of this. Well, let Let's do talk about the war, actually, and uh, see what, what news we usually do not get or do not get a lot of here is um, how the war is covered in CEE, uh, CEE countries, uh, uh, except Ukraine, of course, uh, where there's something else happening right now, as we all know. Uh, but some of us are a little bit surprised about how Poland uh, is doing its job right now with the refugees, actually, because we got a whole bunch of other news uh, in the last 10 years. We said, oh, okay, yeah, we didn't expect that. Uh, or a lot of people didn't. I didn't, to tell you the truth. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about, you know, countries with heavy media capture, as Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, uh, and so forth. What's, um, how is the war reported there? Has something changed there, even in captured media, actually, since the war began? What has happened there? What is happening, or what has happened, or...? What is happening there? I mean, has, has this uh, war actually changed some of the foundations of what you both described as media captures in those three countries I mentioned just now? Let's say Poland, Czech Republic, uh, uh, and Hungary. Because of, um, um, you know, this is very recent, so I cannot talk to you about, you know, um, five years of research evidence in this It's not area. about data, it's so about there, subjective. Therefore, yeah. mm -hmm. therefore, I can only talk about my personal experience being mm -hmm. a Hungarian native speaker, mm -hmm. Hungarian citizen. Um, 
In Hungary, there are two different realities going on right now. It is very similar that for one part of that country, there is no war, but there is defense interventions. And this narrative is propagated by the so-called public slash state media on on several multiple channels, wow. amazing amounts of taxpayers' money to a very, very uh, successful level. This is propagated through all captured private media stations. So it's a Russian burning, so to speak. Th and, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if I go to, um, I live in Vienna. If I go to Budapest and if I have to drive, I love to, re I love to, usually love to listen to radio. Mm -hmm. If I do this, being already within the borders of Hungary, and I try to switch from one radio channel to the other one, and it's the news hours, you won't believe, but you listen to the same news mm -hmm. across channels, across radio stations, because it's the same orchestrated state media um, um, broadcasted news. It's like if you were be in the 50s. And then comes the digital. And then comes all these narratives on the digital platforms, whereby money, advertising, government advertising that is flowing in into Facebook, that is going into Instagram, that is going into all these platforms are helping to display the same narratives to digitally communicating publics. So nothing changed actually in the light of uh, recent events. It's even yeah. worse. It's even worse, okay, I see, wow. Um, maybe a last question to um, Marius before we open this up to the public. Um, the role of radio be it public, private, independent, captured, uh, whatever. I mean, in uh, many, we've had this in this discussion before, that's why I'm actually asking, I'm really curious about it, that in some Western countries, the UK is one, uh, in Germany also, um, the radio has higher trustworthiness uh, in the public than it has had before, actually. Uh, this whole media crisis actually increased the trustworthiness of uh, public radio um, in, in uh, certain states. Uh, can you tell us a little bit something about what happened, but a specific role of radio in some of the CE countries you were looking at. Well, uh, on, yes, it's true, um, where especially when you look at the, um, the, the, the journalism and, and the media um, across Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the economic uh, crisis affected media generally and traditional media uh, very much so, the, the print media, but, uh, but all the media outlets in the country, especially commercial ones, and radio was part of that. But uh, if you really look at the, the data and if you look at the economic models of the radio stations, commercial and pub public usually is funded by the, by the state or by taxpayers yeah. through uh, the license fee. Uh, there is indeed quite a, a resilience in the radio field, in, uh, simply in terms of the audience. People listen to radio. Radio doesn't need necessarily high investments like in television or or, or other fields. So you have you have that, that I think you have that trend in in, in, in many countries. Uh, it's not noticed because people tend even like uh, uh, scholars or researchers or experts <clears throat> covering the media, they tend to oversee the, uh, not, not paying attention to the radio because it's not the big, you know, television has a lot of influence. You look at that, you see who sells what, what TV station. You look at print media because in many countries they, they own large newspapers. And radio is always there. They exist, but when you look at that, they are in fact even some commercial media successful. When we did a number of studies covering Slovakia, uh, Czech Republic, Romania, in fact, radio stations are profitable and they have been profitable profitable during all these years. When it comes to capture to the, the, the more ideological and, and content related mm -hmm. issue, is not much to, to, to say because usually the, the capture phenomenon is not stopping at the, uh, uh, the, the, the limits between media outlets. It's not, I'm going to capture the television station. The whole thing is very, in fact, the, the, uh, um, uh, the, in, in Hungary, which is a textbook uh, case of, of media capture, mm. it has been done and it has been built across, uh, across audiences. It was not uh, the, the prime minister and the oligarch saying, let's now try to capture the radio. They looked in a, in a very holistic way and, and tried to take over key 
media outlets, whatever they were. So to, on, from, from that point of view, radio is, is part of the, where, where you have a highly captured environment, radio is part of the capture, is part of the propaganda. Okay. There is no difference in that. Oh, okay, let's open it up um, to the floor, so to speak, here uh, on site. Um, before we take questions from the digital realm, from Slido, please. Yeah, thank you very much for this really interesting presentation. So I realized while listening to you how difficult it is for us to imagine what it must be like to live in countries with a public sphere that is so different from ours here in Germany. But I have one specific question. The reporting about the upcoming elections in Hungary say, says that there is a fair chance that Orban will lose the election. The way you the way you present the public sphere, um, that sort of hermetic uh, reporting, makes that very unlikely. So that is, uh, I've, I've been wondering about that. How is it possible that an, a, an opposition to the government is forming to such an extent without any established public media? Um, well, um I'm not a political scientist. I'm just a citizen who is going to vote. Um, I'm sorry to say I don't really see any real chance for, for any meaningful change. Um, but next to that, I really wish us not only to consider what we have been talking about here, both Marius, both me, only to the context and, and, and restrict to the context of Hungary because it's much more and much, much way more about that. It's the lack of something that is called public service. We, in Europe, in Germany, in that part of Europe where we really believe in European values and principles, we really, really um, believe, still believe that it is something that is very, very important. And um, in very recent moments um, and, uh, and incidents, uh, in many contexts, the public media really proved and lived up to this challenge. And as a trusted source of information for citizens. This is something that is non-existent, not only in Hungary, but most of the countries. Um, the systemic downplay of the media, as Marius with, uh, demonstrated with data over 17, uh, over, over the years of, of withdrawal of, uh, of uh, investors and their presence there, this is really leaving the digital places, spaces, totally abandoned to those platform driven manipulations um, or platform-based manipulations uh, rather than that, that right now we can see the very, very direct harms of. And, and again, this is not specific to one single co country. So what I'm trying to say is that what is happening here cannot be stopped by a borderline. Because the effects are absolutely direct and imminent to any country, including Germany. Thank you. There's another question in the back. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I was just, um, I just received a mail by Lobby Control, who are currently looking at uh, the digital market policies um, that are being decided on from the EU level. So I, I, I felt like that is the most direct um, way to to control big techs because I do think there are uh, policies happening, but not enough. Um, so what I was thinking was the, the European public is kind of 
forming in a new way since the lockdown. Um, the, the, the boundaries between public and private um, broke down through all of the home office um, and just um, the, I think the normalization of this closeness of the internet, the labor, the private life and the public life, um, they grew together and I was just thinking, um, how do you see um, this transformative shift as a transformation of the democracy as we understand them, like as the deliberation that is at the core of our democracy and our system? And if this deliberation doesn't take place anymore in the public sphere, can we even speak of democracy anymore? Not sure what the question is. So. Well, if, um, I think uh, uh, what she says is that if um, deliberation, which is at the heart of what she understands as democracy, is sort of receding in pandemic times, where we are mainly uh, communicating through the internet, uh, um, uh, how is this going to play out right. uh, in the future if deliberation basically is receding because we communicate mainly digitally? The question probably would be, is the digital realm not yeah. a realm of deliberation? Thank but, you. Yeah. yeah, well, I think <laughs> That's a crucial question, and I think uh, this is especially important in this part of the world, in, in Central and Eastern European countries, uh, because of uh, because of the the tradition, uh, the regulatory tradition that has existed in these places. And this is what I mentioned when I spoke about content regulation. Um, what I expect over the next um, uh, coming years is a slew of of laws in most of, of these countries that are going to, to make communication and access to information even, even more difficult. And that's why I think when, when we talk about legislation and intervention in the European Union and what is happening with, with the laws that are adopted in Brussels, uh, maybe they work for some Western European countries and mm -hmm. they create the space for regulation of tech platforms, which, which can be done and should be done. As, as I said, I, I'm a believer in, in um, uh, I, I believe in regulating them at the structure level, but when it comes to content, uh, to the content level, to the way we deliberate, we use the digital space, I think that that's, a ve that's a real danger. And what I'm saying is we have uh, we had a number of of laws that are uh, that are, were adopted by by the EU. We had the law or the, the GDPR that is misused in Hungary, in fact, to to clamp down on journalism. Uh, the, the, many of these countries are taking and misusing the the legal uh, the legal developments uh, at EU level to close the space because that is the only space when we look at what we discussed today. There was a trend of, of taking over private media outlets. There was a trend of taking over the regulation. And the only space that is still open is the internet, is the place where, where you can still find uh, information and, and criticism and investigative journalism. And that's, that's the space that, they, that these governments are trying to, to close over the next years. How they are going to do that? I strongly believe that law will be, will be one thing, and we can talk about concrete examples, as, 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 I, as, I, as I just said. Uh, there, there are cases where governments are using you, are misusing you regulation to force journalists to remove names of people from their stories, and it happened several times. And I think that is going to, to continue. I think that is the, the biggest danger, actually, that we are facing, because at the level of the, the legacy, why do I call it the legacy media, as, as we call it, <laughs> the, the, the the project is more or less completed in many countries, but when it comes to the space that really matters, the space that is still free, that is going to be the battle of the next years. Within the current con context with the, uh, the war in Ukraine, I, I also expect uh, a massive increase of the government's intervention in the media in various ways, in funding, in setting up new outlets, in, in funding more propaganda channels, because everybody now sees how important it is actually to control the, the narrative. And within that, that context, I think the, um, the danger of closing um, uh, or controlling the, the, the digital space is very real in our part of the world. Thank you, Marius. I think we had one more question in the back. I think we're running out of time here a little bit before we uh, have to talk to the people from Slido uh, in a minute, but uh, there's one in the back. Please make this quick. Uh, I was wondering uh, the, that you did not mention two influences which I think are particular in, in Central and Eastern Europe. One, a tradition of strong state surveillance that was kind of multiplied or made way more efficient and also kind of imposing self-censorship both on media and, let's say, private citizens. 
in, in Central Eastern Europe, and the second dimension, the, the strategic trolling that take, took place in starting in Russia and basically impacting us in Germany, but even stronger you guys over there. And setting a kind of standard of communication that's really bad in terms of hate speech and not trying to get a message across, but basically sending the signal there's no such thing as truth or facts, but it kind of depends on your interests and how you sell your, your ideas. I understand that this is a comment rather than a question. Um, I think you are right. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't, couldn't agree more. <laughs> this is what I could say. Um, surveillance, absolutely. Um, this is what I've called the several uh, shades of censorship. And how, for example, state surveillance of journalists and uh, uh, abuse of laws against journalists, how it affects their work. Sometimes um, it is referred to soft censorship. This is also something that we have learned in the CE context. So couldn't agree more. And harassment, online harassment. And here there's a very important gendered layer because um, there we have already very um, uh, a uh, strong body of evidence how much women are uh, usually disproportionately um, affected by these kind of trolls and orchest orchestrated uh, online harassment. It's very interesting, really quick to, to make a reversal here. Couldn't we also uh, argue for the exact opposite and say um, societies that have been under surveillance for many decades are especially sensitive uh, to captured media and, and, and to propaganda outlets. I mean, that's what in part, at least, is happening in Eastern Germany, uh, where people who have been under surveillance for 40 years, um, um, many of them are saying, oh, we're having uh, this mainstream media kind of Lügenpresse environment here, uh, and they actually argue with their tradition of being surveilled, having been surveilled for 40 years. So the opposite could be true too, is it? No, not in, no, I don't think uh, it, it happens in, in too many countries. If you look at all the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, they were all, all part of the communist uh, regimes for, for many years. Sure. And yes, then there was an appetite for consuming, for media consumption, free information. But then the reaction when you saw these trends that we discussed today, the, mm -hmm. the ownership uh, concentration, the, uh, I know they are very technical terms, and but, but they have a very, very uh, key impact on the society. They actually mm -hmm. alter and manipulate the, the public discourse, the information that people get. Um, and the reaction of the nation, of the people across the region was not, I don't think it was like what you describe here in most, of, of course you cannot generalize, it's, yeah. uh, you cannot say that everybody reacted the same, but if you look at the audiences. Not in Eastern Germany either, yeah. But <laughs> uh, Exactly, so I, I don't think, in fact that was a bit puzzling because when you look at what, what happened and especially for nations that came after so many years of, of um, uh, control of the, the narratives, uh, after so many years of state media, one state media organization controlling the flow of information, mm -hmm. and you see the, uh, the, uh, the power of manipulation and propaganda media in these countries, you are, uh, I think anyone would be a bit uh, surprised and, and puzzled by, mm -hmm. by the non-reaction of, uh, of mm -hmm. people to that, and by the power of disinformation, in fact. And just commenting on the, the gentleman's point and what Christina was saying, I think it's uh, what, what the danger now is, um, and this is something that I, I read in, in a book published last year by a, a scholar in the States, Taylor Dodson. I, I don't agree with many of the things that he describes in the book, but he's talking about the, our transition that we didn't feel yet from the post-truth uh, um, how shall we call it, a uh, period or a uh, phase of, of communication development into the post-trust uh, era, which mm. is much more dangerous. Sure. It's the yeah. time when, yes, we are all used that everybody lies, there are you know, facts and non-facts everywhere in the media, they are propagated by state media, but what is even more dangerous is when we reach the point where actually the trust stops having any value, if at all. Mm. Yeah. We could make a whole evening about apathy under uh, <laughs> actually surveillance societies and so forth, what this leads to. But let's see what's uh, up in Slido. Please, Sarah, can you um, give us a couple of questions before we wrap this up here? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. 
Um, we received a couple of questions via Slido, and I would like to start with the topic of independence of media. Um, the question is, as for financial sustainability of the region's independent media, how feasible, how widely used are alternative financial models, for example, crowdfunding, subscriptions? I can briefly uh, answer that I think that is uh, those alternative models are the only chance at least for the moment for for independent media um, and again I, I have to, to all I think it's very important to think about the, what we kept talking today about the these two worlds of journalism in in many countries and especially in the environments with very captured media outlets you have a massive uh, f f media field that has thousands of employees they call themselves journalists working and being funded by the state and then you have very few media outlets that uh, it's a very slim sector with a few media outlets that are doing investigative journalism and that are struggling financially well those media outlets are the only um, example of independent journalism and they in fact are funded through these alternative sources of funding crowdfunding funds or grants from um, foundations and all that but that is not that is not the future. You cannot, yeah. you cannot expect uh, George Soros or uh, whoever uh, in the West to fund you in your life. That is not a business model. Because I know the captured media are too big, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's yes, it is happening. In fact, this mo this uh, funding models are very important to exist because otherwise these outlets wouldn't be able to operate. But on a longer term, this is not the this is not the future. I think the future is a combination of funding models. But one element that must be there is the subscription. You, you must have people involved. If yeah. people do not pay for your journalism, you have no future. Um, sorry, just to... So it's not feasible. The answer is it's not feasible. The very few ones, the other ones, I've got the digital nomads, are the crowdfunded ones. It's just a very tiny element of any business model. But the vast value transfer that is happening between the media and the platforms without unsettling the impact of this value transfer and so many other things, including state advertising and state funding, there is no feasibility. Thank you. One more from Slido, Sarah? Of course. Um, we have received another question to regulation of platforms. Um, can the attempts of regulation of disinformation be considered as censorship? It, uh, Regulation of platforms as censorship? That's the question. Um, no, I think it was regulation of disinformation, whether it, it exactly can be. Exactly, regulation of ah, okay. disinformation. Okay, okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, we see in many countries that this is also something that is weaponized and, uh, and journalists who were, were called and criminalized as cape for, uh, um, uh, what, what was the, the, the Hungarian name of the uh, skate one? Well, ma, those who were spreading this information, they were uh, threatened by criminal offenses. So this, this information was actually the critique of the government's public health instruments. So criminalization of this information is a very, very um, difficult, and let, let it put it this way, usually against international norms and standards on freedom of expression. It's not the best way to go. One very quick one from Slido before we really <laughs> end this overtime session here. Then maybe another one to independence of media. Um, how do citizens deal with the situation? This probably is to the situation in Hungary. How do they evaluate and perceive the information they receive through the media? Well, I think you're, you're, uh, the, um, uh, our viewer refers to the, the discussion about propaganda and how, uh, I guess, right? That was the question, how, how state media or how media in Hungary are, are covering the war. And yeah, I, th I think Christina said it all, but um, just to, to add, I wanted, in fact, to add when we talked about that, I think um, the, uh, the, what is happening with the coverage of the war in Hungary, what is happening with the coverage of war in Poland, which is not uh, pro-Russian propaganda, Agenda, in fact, really shows how politicized the whole field is, because and how related 
to the election cycle is, because in Hungary, the whole uh, discussion and debate has to be put in the context of the upcoming elections. They, in fact, they are uh, coming in less than two weeks. Um, and that was, um, the whole discussion and coverage was actually driven by the, the political power and uh, primarily by the prime minister who needs to secure elections. So what you have in Hungary is pro-Russian propaganda on the state media or pro-government media, which is most of the media in the country. And that is because there is a, a large part of the voters in Hungary that, uh, who in fact support that. And they support that because there have been more than 10 years of pro Putin a friendship or friendship with, with Putin and, and Orban, where people actually saw Russia as, as an ally. But on the other hand, there is a very thin line there where um, the Prime Minister in Hungary also recognizes that there are people who are against the war, simply against the, the aggression, and they assimilate that, uh, I, I believe, with, with the, the power in Russia. And he, at the same time, doesn't want to scare those people off. Um, and what, what he's doing is sometimes in public speeches he's, um, uh, he's talking against the war. Uh, in fact, he uses that to attack uh, the opposition. He, he actually said that the opposition wants to send troops and weapons to Ukraine, which they never said. And on the other hand, he orders the state media, because that is ha that's how it works in Hungary, he orders the state media to, to be pro-Kremlin and pro-Russia pro, pro because of his very close relation with, uh, with Putin. So it's a very difficult way to, uh, for, for people not living there, I think it's a bit difficult to really understand know why is he playing this balancing act uh, but we have to really think and we have to think in the case of Poland and other countries about the election factor that is very that is crucial I think in 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 how coverage of the media is um, is carried out as a very last question now um, we've had great almost mythical not necessarily true internet digital moments uh, in geopolitical events in the last 20 years most of all the Arab Spring right uh, in Cairo and all of uh, northern Africa uh, where people said well the internet actually co-organized those type of revolutions because I mean none of the traditional media they were all state controlled uh, could or would participate in that movement. So we had this great internet movement. Didn't turn out so well. Uh, we know that now, but the initial spark of the movement uh, was definitely there and definitely had a digital reason. Now, do you expect something similar to happen in certain CEE countries? Because what we see, what we see now, media-wise, in Russia is pure dystopia. You can be jailed for saying the word war, right? Uh, you cannot say this. It's still a special operation. Everybody knows this. Everybody keeps reading about this. I'm sure this information is getting through. Uh, um, so do you sort of await a new sensibility towards um, state-captured or private-captured media, uh, so to speak, in the future? Is this uh, going to set off a new digital movement? You await something like this in some Eastern European countries who must be clearly afraid, as many Berliners are as well. Uh, <clears throat> Well, um, the less optimistic but true and truthful answer would be no. Mm. It, um, actually, no is the answer that it's not going to happen by itself. Mm. So there is no, not hope that there will be an Arab Spring type of revolutionary whatever. Um, and, and then the new generations are going to rise up and organize on the internet and on social media platforms, um, um, a revolution against um, the uh, the narratives, so mm. to say. This is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, several things could happen. Um, definitely, uh, the the orchestrated propaganda could be brought up and should be and must be mm. um, uh, uh, stopped. Um, there is a lot to do in terms of regulation of what digital platforms have to invest in, in terms of not letting their profitability override the safety of, civil, of, the, uh, of the citizens, um, of people who are harassed, who are targeted, who are bombarded by trolls. So there's a lot to do also in that sense. And also there's a lot about educating. I don't really like this word, but rather 
the empowerment, I think, would be the, right, the be better word here of old, young generations to, to use these technologies to get truthful information. But that also needs a lot of other arrangements. I think education is fine in this context, since one of the partnering agencies is called Civic uh, Agency for uh, no Federal Agency for Civic Education. So I think you're uh, fine with this. Thank you for this uh, closing statement, uh, Christina. What's your take on this morning? Yes, Do you uh, expect anything digital to happen in the near future? No, I, I totally agree. I don't. I don't see that things are happening online, and you see, in fact, most of the initiatives that that break the media capture are happening yeah. only online. But yeah. I don't see the moment that you are talking about. About. And and that is linked to, to uh, one factor that I think is very important and very few people, um, uh, in fact, analyze it, which is the the long-lasting impact of the cap of the, mm. the media capture phenomenon. Um, the even cultural in, impact, right? Yes, the question, the impact on audiences. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, if you have, for, as in Hungary or other countries, uh, the Czech Republic was threatened by by a similar media capture phenomenon uh, some years ago. Uh, these are these are this is a development that is going over more than a decade. Mm -hmm. So you have a large part of the population that actually receives information for more than a decade. Imagine how long is that from the same source of information and the, the impact of manipulation is huge. And sometimes we uh, uh, people tend to speak or expect the elections as the save, you know, the the moment where the nation and the media will be saved, thinking that if the opposition wins, everything will be fine. Media outlets will be suddenly independent tomorrow, and everything will be great, like 11 years ago. No, uh, the damage is massive. These people have listened and consumed propaganda for 10 years, a large part of of the the, the population of these countries, and that is not going away in, in in one year. It will take even more to actually go to a, um, a, f a level of normality, so to speak. So I don't expect anything happening there. I think the um, the, the impact of manipulation and propaganda and capture is is really deep, and I think it will take years until we actually manage to to measure it. But on the other hand, I don't think the all hope is lost. I think I think the internet, the digital space, is in fact the only space where where opposition, resilience, um, diversity, and pluralism will will happen in the future. There is no other space where 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 the such uh, such manifestations and such such developments in the media field can happen. That is the only space, and that that's why it's really important to guard that space and to make sure it is not um, hijacked, closed, or um, uh, or uh, captured. Yeah, but I think the threat or the pressure on Central and Eastern European countries on all of Europe, actually, has never been as great as in this very moment for 70 years. Don't you think that is going to change anything? Change? Um, I really hope that this is going to be a wake-up call to so-called Western European countries to overcome their business interests and take seriously that what is happening in this part of the world is not isolated anymore and they cannot they cannot let this go away this is what i hope yeah, I, I I think so, and I I think not not much. In fact, will will be changed. I think on the other hand, what's going to happen, as as we discussed, is uh, a growing role of the government because such an extreme situation, a war situation, shows not only governments but everyone how important it is in fact to control the narrative. So I expect worse things. In fact, we released today a study um, uh, based on a survey among 200 um, or so journalists in many countries that was carried out. A week or so after the, the, the eruption of the war. Um, and the, the expectations of journalists are very pessimistic and very negative. They're, they already have signals that in many countries the advertising budgets have been cut. Uh, companies inform them that they are going to stop the funding. They see a lot of problems in terms of their very the, the very operation of their businesses. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about the impact on population, people actually buying the pro-Russian narrative. So I don't really know. I don't think 
think uh, we'll we'll see that. But again, it's not. I, I don't want to end on this pessimistic note. I think that that's the challenge we we have to face now, and mm. we have the space to do it, and we have to defend that space. That's crucial. If if we if we move into an era of splinter net or um, or uh, a closed and controlled internet and digital space, I think it's going to be the the uh, the worst probably moment of the digital uh, era that we have se we have seen and experienced so far. Well, I didn't promise anybody a happy ending, that's for sure, and uh, we didn't get that either. Uh, very uh, unusual evening and a very unusual time. Thank you for making the trip and uh, filling us in on what's happening in Central and Eastern Europe. It's a very important evening to our audience, to me, that's for sure. Thank you so much, Mario Stragomir, Cristina Rosgoni. Thank you for being Thank here. You. Thank you for watching. Tschüss. Thank you.